video, I would like to show the distinctions between being a property owner and being a note investor. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I've seen people that are in one or the other of these two investment arenas, and it's important to keep them separate. I, I see sometimes people who are note investors who are treating notes like their property, which they aren't. So we have to be careful that we don't mix these two worlds up. And if it's a note, we need to evaluate it as a note and whether it's something we should invest in as a note. And once it converts to a property, then we really put on a whole different hat. And so I'd like to show the difference between these and you decide which of these two worlds you would rather invest in. Now, I think you know what my... Uh, my presupposition is, and that is I prefer note investing, and so hopefully this will help you to see uh, that there are some distinctions that maybe you want to avail yourself of as well. So first of all, let's take a look at the income from a property. Now, as you know, if you're a property owner, you receive rent, okay, and of course that's on a monthly basis, whereas for a note investor, they're receiving mortgage payments. Now, mortgage payments and rent are very, very different things. As you know, uh, a mortgage payment comes from a borrower, whereas a rent, rent payment comes from a tenant. Now, just the fact that that relationship exists, that a tenant and a landlord relationship is fundamentally different than a borrower and a lender relationship, that, that role distinction is huge because the tenant sees the property as, the own, as owned by the property investor. And so that sets up a fundamentally different relationship. That tenant perceives that they have rights to, to receive from the property owner to keep that, that property in the condition that the tenant prefers. As well, there's kind of a, a built-in relationship of the, uh, the tenant uh, maybe not wanting to fulfill some of the obligations that the property owner puts on the tenant and taking care of their property. Now, shift over to that of the borrower and the lender. The borrower never calls the lender to fix up the property or to repair something. This just doesn't happen. This is just not, not in existence. Um, a person doesn't call, you know, Chase Bank to fix the toilet, right? So that fundamental role difference really lays out a huge advantage of being a lender over a property owner. So let's take a look at the next feature, and that is liability. Now by liability, I mean by this, liabilities inherent with the property itself. For example, if there is someone visiting your tenant and they slip and fall, you as a property owner can be liable for something that maybe is a defect on the property. So your liability is actually high and it's of course very advised for property owners in our society, very litigious society, to have some form of insurance on the property and then also an umbrella policy for the property owner. Now let's shift over to what that's like for the lender, the liability is actually very low. There aren't people suing banks because of conditions of property unless there are some exceptions to that that I've heard of where the, the lender has been wholly ne negligent and the property is vacant. And there have been a few, uh, I, I know of one lawsuit that where they uh, actually did go after the lender because the, the swimming pool was a, a big mess and it was a liability for the neighborhood. Well, as a note holder, um, all you have to do is make sure that the property isn't in that kind of a condition and you can avoid that because that's extremely rare. Uh, just compare that to the likelihood of having high liability with a rental and there's absolutely no comparison. In terms of credit risk, if uh, you as a property owner have taken out a bank loan in order to purchase that property, your credit is at risk. If the uh, tenant is not paying your rent or if the market makes uh, a, a dive, then your credit is at risk of because you're not able to pay the mortgage every month, which then puts you at greater risk of being able to scale your business model and buy other properties. And let's compare that to being a lender. 
there really is no credit risk at all. And the reason is because you were the lender. You, ha you did not have to apply for buying this, this loan. You used your own money, you didn't borrow it, and so there isn't any credit risk. Uh, in fact, the, the borrower is at risk to you because if they don't pay you, then you can, of course, report their credit to their credit uh, agency that they have not paid you. Now let's take a look at management. As we know, for property management, most property owners uh, are paying between 8 and 10 percent, and 10 uh, percent may not be enough to have them do a good job, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I've gone down that road a, a, a number of times. And, and then you can add on top of that another 10% for a vacancy factor. And so you're up to about 20, between 16 and 20% of uh, the, the fact that you're not going to be getting that income from, for the year and management. So we really, are, are having, we really need to account for this if we have a rental. Now, $30 a month is what you would pay as a lender for that loan to be serviced. That's it. And in some cases, some servicing companies only charge you about $15 a month. So that's really all it is. And there isn't any maintenance because the property owner, uh, of course, the borrower, takes care of the property. They're caring for your collateral. They don't call you to fix it. In fact, they wouldn't expect you to fix it. Uh, they're fixing it up themselves because they have that ownership principle in their heart that says, I want to own a home. And that ownership principle drives them to fixing up that property, keeping it maintained, taking care of your collateral. I mean, let's get on the good side of the way things work, guys. This is the way to go. Uh, if you own uh, a note, they're going to take care of the property collateral for you. And then in terms of duration... Most tenants on a national basis stay in their homes about one to five years, and five years if you're lucky. Now, there are cases where people stay longer, but those are rare. Whereas for a, a tenant, for a um, property owner paying you as a lender, your loan term can be anywhere from five to 30 years. Now, that is an income stream that's uninterrupted if you do it right, for up to 30 years. I know of people that are writing loans for 40 years. Uh, amazing. So you compare that to the amount of times when you're going to have to redress that property when you have a vacancy and fill it up again, and you just have this consistent income stream for a loan that you own. So when I look at these features on each side of the table here, uh, even though I really started out as a property investor and was one for 30 years, I have shifted over to being a note investor almost 100%. Now, there are times when I will start out as a note investor and then I can convert something over to a rental or to a seller finance property. And I, I will do that. But I've started out as a note investor and I, when I'm ready to put on that other hat, I make sure that I know I'm making that transition. I don't mix the two. I make sure that when I'm evaluating notes, I evaluate them as notes. And I'll tell you one example of how it's important not to get these mixed up. Imagine if you're evaluating a note, but you look more at the property than at the note to decide whether you want to buy the note. There's a big problem with that. Because what if the loan file has, has flaws in it? What if not everything's in the file that's needed to be there? And, but you're enamored with the property. See what I'm talking about? We have to really evaluate the note as a loan file and make sure that that loan file is going to provide you the income that you need or you're going to be able to foreclose and get the property. In either case, you're evaluating it as a loan file first and foremost. Now, that isn't to say we don't take a look at the property to make sure it's one that we wouldn't mind owning. Of course we do that. But that's our second step. We always make sure we evaluate it as a note first. And, and so I wanted to lay this out for you so that you can decide what are you more, a property investor or a note investor. And, and by the fact that you're here watching this, you probably are more a note investor. And so that being the case, I'm going to challenge you to really think like a note investor. And notes are not unlike... Uh, 
other things that you can trade that are just you know paper and you want to you want to really think about it as a paper business yes it's secured paper and we always want to make sure there's a good piece of collateral with it but you want to make sure the paper has value in itself is it written right are all the documents there and 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 you want to make sure that that itself is is set before you consider what the property is like one last issue I'd like to explore with you is the issue of scalability and how scalability affects a business model based upon property investing versus note investing. And what I'd like to propose to you that it's very important for us to see how much we can actually grow a business with either property or with notes because of what we call the realities of life. <laughs> now, if you were somehow able to acquire 50 rental properties and you were getting an average amount of rent for those as a national average, you would be getting around $200 a month net. Now, of course, that's after expenses. That's after your property taxes are paid, after you've had to pay for maintenance, property management, vacancy factor, all those things. But the net profit for property investors nationwide is about $200. So it would require you to have about 50 properties in order for you to net $10,000 a month. Now, I would propose to you that 50 properties is a lot of properties. I have a friend who has 20 properties, and every time I call him, his phone is ringing. I try not to take it personally. I don't think he's trying to get away from talking with me. But he, his phone is always ringing. Now, granted, he manages them himself. Nevertheless, 50 is a lot to get, get $10,000 a month net. Now, let's contrast that with notes. Now, we've talked about with notes, the servicing company does the collections, and they can also even handle foreclosure for you if something goes wrong, if the customer stops paying you. And so the actual outlay of your effort and time is really, really reduced. You, the, the tenant, is, the borrower is not calling you um, to do anything with the property, and so that is really keeping your phone quiet. So let's just take a look at what it would be, what your uh, income would be on a monthly basis if you had 50 notes. Now remember, you're not having to subtract out um, property taxes and insurance and expenses, maintenance on the property. The only thing you have to subtract out is your servicing costs of about $30 a month. So if you're able to accumulate 50 notes, the average for a nationwide rental, sorry, a nationwide income for those notes is about $500 a month. Now I teach that it's important for us to buy unpaid principal balance notes of at least $50,000 and, and up. So I don't really believe in buying low balance loans. And so that's how I can make sure that I keep this at about $500 or more a month. So if I'm getting $500 times 50 notes, that's a nice income stream of $25,000 a month. Now, is it possible for you to, to scale back or to scale up from that? Absolutely. If you, if you want to go beyond 50, you certainly can. Uh, I personally know of someone who has 100 seller finance notes nationwide, and his income right now is about $50,000 a month. And is his phone ringing? No. No, it's very, very easy for him to manage 100 notes on a monthly basis. So I wanted to show you that the scalability factor is really important in considering which of these two worlds you want to live in. Do you want to max out at 20 to 50 houses that you can manage? Or do you want to just start at 50 notes and go up from there almost without missing a beat? So this is a choice that you have. And personally, I'm investing in more notes than I am in properties. Of course, properties are great for rental income but I prefer to lean on the side of the note investing and turn those into cash flowing paper because the management issues are just so much easier. All right, well, that's it for this video. 
I hope that I have persuaded you to lean more toward the no-divesting side, and I look forward to hearing about your success.